Hi, Alan. Hi, Alan, how are you today? Hi, Jessica, how are you? I'm well, Jackie, how about you? Uh, good, it sounds like you've had an interesting few days. <laughs> oh yeah, it's gonna continue for a bit, I think. Alan, <laughs> <laughs> how are you this afternoon? Yeah, good, Great. thank you, afternoon. All right, let's see. Hi, Susie. Hi, Jeremy, how are you today? You've got Andrew, hi, Andrew. Hello. All right. Hi, Charles. All right. So we will give, uh, give everybody a few more minutes. To, uh, to join us before we jump in and uh, do a roll call and um, and then just get right into the meeting. <coughs> Hi, Allison. Hi, Alex. How are you both? Oh, hello. hey, everybody. All right, everyone, we're going to just wait a few more minutes to let some more of our committee members join us today. Hi, Marion. Marion, are you flying solo today? I heard from Lori that she wasn't going to be able to join us today. Yeah, she's at a conference, so okay. I'm the only one here. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, <laughs> for representing. <laughs> All right, we will wait just uh, a little longer. I know we're waiting on Barbara Kendall still and a couple of other folks. All right, well, let's give everybody just one more minute. Oh, good, there's Barbara, perfect timing. And Maura, great, okay. Okay. Very good. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Maura. Hey, how are you? Sorry about that. <clears throat> That's okay. 
All right, so I think we have the majority of our of our committee here today. Alan, Barbara, are you okay if we go ahead and get started? Sure. All right. Yeah, please do. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started with a roll call, and then we'll jump into presentation. Um, I am Jackie Higgs with MJ Engineering, and um, joining me today are two uh, members of our team that you have not yet met. Um, I'm happy to announce that Maura uh, has welcomed a new member of her family is in, and is on maternity leave. So you will not be seeing Nora um, until December. <laughs> so we've brought on a couple of other team members uh, that are also assisting other communities with LWRP. So they're very familiar with the program. Um, Sarah Stark Hess will be the lead planner and Jesse McKay um, will also be uh, is also a planner assisting us today. Uh, through the next few months on this. Um, also from our team, uh, we have Andrew Seiberg from Bay Environmental mm. and Marty Tory from Captain Consulting. All right. Um, with that, um, I'd like to introduce our, our town uh, representatives. Alan is here. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. All right. And uh, Barbara Kendall from the Department of State is here as is Jeremy Campbell, also from the Department of State in the South Shore Estuary Reserve Program. All right, and then it, I'm just gonna go in the order that you are showing up on my Zoom. Um, Susie is here. Hi folks. Charles. Marion. Maura. Allison. Everybody. Alex. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jessica from the county. And Anthony. Did I miss anybody? All right. And I do want to thank Michelle from the town uh, public um, information office uh, for hosting us today and getting us all on track with the Zoom information. So thank you, Michelle. Appreciate your assistance with that. All right, so with that, I am going to go ahead and share my screen and we have a brief presentation today and uh, then we will turn it over to Barbara uh, to really focus in on um, the bulk of our discussion, which is the Harbor Management Plan, okay? So um, I'm gonna do a brief update of the schedule, where we are, where we're headed, um, Sarah's going to talk a little bit about some of the updates to the existing conditions mapping. And then we're going to go into a discussion of the Harbor Management Plan Overview. Barbara's going to assist with that. And then the primary purpose of our discussion today is to talk about the Harbor Management Plan, talking about water uses um, um, and uh, whether it's surface water, underwater structures, what have you. Uh, so we're going to really be focused on that today. Then we'll talk a little bit about next steps and wrap it up. So we have gone through all of the introductions. Uh, here we are in terms of the uh, project schedule. So our last time together, we were talking about um, an introduction of uh, proposed land and water uses and projects. And so our team internally has been meeting uh, to talk through advancing those and refining those based on feedback that we got from all of you at our last meeting together. Um, now, here we are, believe it or not, it's uh, it's fall, maybe not technically yet, we have a couple of weeks, um, but we are working on developing the various sections of the LWRP, um, including the inventory and analysis, the policies, et cetera. Um, but we're really shifting gears and also focusing now on the harbor management plan. The development of a harbor management plan is a requirement through this process, and it will accompany the LWRP. And it's really the water side of things, and uh, Barbara will take us through that a little bit more. Um, we do want to talk, and we have talked in the past with uh, Alan about how best to keep the town board members uh, engaged. And our team is, um, our consultant team is planning a site visit in October to be looking at uh, some of the specific areas where the, the proposed land and water projects have been identified 
And we're also going to be working with Alan about uh, having opportunities to meet with the town board members whose districts are located within the waterfront revitalization area that this group has identified. Moving forward, we're going to continue to draft the various sections of the LWRP and look to introduce the public to some of these more refined uh, proposed projects and some of the ideas that are coming out of the Harbor Management Plan discussion. Moving ahead, we'll continue with all of that in the spring, and uh, we anticipate wrapping up the project in the summer of 2023. So with that, I will turn it over to Sarah to talk a little bit about um, our updated mapping. As you know, when we introduced some of the existing conditions mapping, we, we got some great comments back from all of you, um, as well as Alan, and so we've been working to refine that. And Sarah's just going to do a quick little check-in and then also share with you uh, an approach that we have modified with regard to mapping uh, due to the, the sheer scale and size of the uh, of the town in our study area. So Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, great. Thank you. Well, hi, everyone. It's nice to meet you all, even in this virtual setting. Uh, today, I just wanted to walk through a few of the updates that we've been making to your existing conditions mapping. Um, these updates were made based on some of the feedback that we've heard from this group. Um, and the first modification to that is including the, uh, the Patchogue River within the boundary. So you can see that uh, highlighted with the red arrow up at the top. And then we've also reduced the, the water side boundary of your WRA um, from your municipal boundary and moved it um, closer, closer to the shoreline to 1,500 feet um, from the shore. In addition to that, um, since it's such a large study area, uh, we've been working on splitting the map into to smaller areas in order to more clearly illustrate some of the features within the study area. Uh, right now, we've split each map into a three map series. Uh, on, the, on the left, it highlights more of the Great South Bay area. In the center, uh, a little bit more of um, the village of Patchog as well as Bellport. And then on the right, uh, some of Mastic Beach and more reaches Bay. Okay, um, so I will pause here to see if there's any feedback to how we've made that distinction, um, but we can also work through and talk through a, an example um, for the land use map uh, highlighting how that split would, would show. Okay. Question about the Patchogue River. Pardon? I have a question about the Patchogue River. Absolutely, um, go right I'm ahead. I'm curious, this has nothing to do with the boundary, but um, I guess I didn't realize it went up that far. Is that the Patchogue River or the Patchogue River watershed? Uh, from my understanding, that is the, the Patchogue River and I believe the, the wetland area it en encompasses. Right, so that's north of Sunrise Highway? Yes. Okay, I didn't, um, as we know it in the village, I you know, I think of it as as ending before it gets to uh, Patchogue River, uh, because okay. before it gets to Sunrise, but you would know better. You you mapped everything. <sighs> well, okay, um, our team mapped everything, uh, but we will definitely uh, take a closer look at that as well and get you a more specific answer on exactly what was included. Yeah, yeah it's neither here nor there, actually. I sure. just, thanks. No, no I actually problem. have a related question. What's the basis for the northern edge of your sort of boundary area. Okay, so that is the Sunrise Highway. Okay. And I so believe So you're just stopping it there? Yes, I believe that was the, the discussion with the WAC at some of your earlier meetings. And I don't know if uh, Jackie or Alan, if you want to weigh in a little bit more on why that distinction was made. Sure. Um Allison, to your question, um one of the uh one of the factors considered in, in identifying a defined WRA boundary is, um, is uh, an easily recognizable boundary, right? Sometimes it's natural, sometimes it's man-made. Um, and so this seemed after discussions with this group and with Alan to be the logical Northern terminus of the WRA. Um, and so that, that's really the, the reasoning behind that. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. okay. Are there any other questions um, regarding these changes to the mapping or perhaps the, the split of each of these maps into a series. How, how come uh, you include a lot of land area in the, the right three, uh, two areas, but uh, you, it's, it stops at the shoreline on the left-hand part? 
So Charles, that is the municipal boundary, uh, the, the Western municipal boundary for the town of Brookhaven. Mm -hmm. And why don't you uh, divide it by the uh, um, points rather, you know, like uh, um, at Smith Point uh, Bridge area to, because okay. that area to the right is sort of one area, the area to the to the left should be Bellport and Patchogue Bays and then the stuff farther to the east, the west. It seems we, these vertical yeah. lines seem very artificial. Yeah, well, that's why we wanted to ask this group what your thoughts were about this, um, you know, and if there are more logical approaches. And this is simply for the presentation of the existing conditions mapping, because we have uh, been finding that due to the scale of the uh, the study area, it's really hard to get a, a, a focused look. And so we're just kind of, uh, you know, trying to subdivide, if you will, for the purposes of of being able to view things more easily. Um, and Charles, if there, um, and we can share this with you, and if there are uh, more logical uh, delineations, um, we're happy to make that um, in a way that, that is a little more um, meaningful uh, based on how, how everybody sees these, these areas and, and um, you know, views these areas and experiences this area. So um, I, I just wanna say, for me, I look at, um... I mean, you've split Mastic Beach right in half. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know if that matters. If we're, I mean, it's uh, to yeah. me, that doesn't seem right. Either shift it okay. west or shift yeah. it. East. I, now, I yeah. think splitting it in half is not good. Now, to that point, I, I, I do want to say that some of these areas are encompassed, particularly around the dashed line, are encompassed by more than one map. So, as we get into the example, um, keep some of those comments in mind and see. Um, to kind of see if it's still still an issue. So Sarah, let's move into the example <laughs> sure. so that folks can get a, a better visual. Yeah, so here's the rightmost map. Uh, so, so this is the first series uh, in the, the map series for your existing land use. Um, the primary changes to this map include um, the modification um, to, to more accurately depict a lot of your parkland areas that were previously depicted as vacant lands or as community service lands. Uh, so now your primary land use is still uh, primarily low density resi residential. And that 25% number is 25% of the land area within your WRA boundary. Uh, but then your uh, second most prevalent land use within uh, your WRA is parks and recreation, which accounts for 23% of the land area or uh, roughly 8,300 uh, acres which works out to about 13 square miles. So it's quite, quite a bit of land within the WRA. So that's depicted in green here. Uh, so now here's that first map. You, you do see that it does encompass part of the village of Pashog, as well as a good section of the Great South Bay. Now moving into the second map, uh, you notice here as well that there is a little bit of overlap. You can see a little bit of Pashog here. You can also see all of Mastic Beach. Um, but we really just did this to be able to display uh, three, three separate maps, but also zoom in just a little bit more so you can see a little bit more of that detail that just wasn't coming out in that, in that single map. Okay, and then finally, here's your third map in the, in the series that shows a little bit more towards Mauritius Bay. It does show a little bit more of, uh, of Mastic Beach as well. So there is, like I said, a little bit of overlap between these maps. Um, but I will pause there to see if you have any feedback. Uh, Maura, that's, yeah, no, that's fine. I just, sure. I just wanted to make sure you could see the whole thing. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And what we can do, um, because this is the first time, obviously, that you all are seeing this, um, and you know, we were. Uh, just from a graphic representation standpoint, really struggling with how to present this in the document itself in an eight and a half by 11 or 11 by 17 yeah. image, quite, you know, from a practical standpoint. Um, so what we can do, we're, we're still finalizing some of the other updated mapping. Once we have that, we can, um, you know, put this in a OneDrive link and, and allow you the time to take a look at it to make sure everything is captured um, and makes sense to you. 
just just one thing I want to um, mention. It seems like some of the rivers um, are labelled as parks, like the Forge River and some of the other rivers to the east. So we'll yeah. have to take a look. Yeah, we'll at take a look. I'm not seeing that, but we'll, I'll take a closer look for sure. Yeah, I'm wondering if it's the land adjacent to those. Yeah, and maybe the, it is, yeah. maybe it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, the land use classification uh, layer in the GIS data might be on top of the river. Sure. Um, yeah. It might be it might be something as simple as we need to bring the rivers to the top layer. Um, so yeah. we'll take a closer look. Yeah, what you're looking at here, uh, typically in the land use maps, we don't include uh, a river layer because we're really trying to illustrate what your land use classifications are for each of those those parcels. But we would be displaying uh, the blue lines for the rivers within uh, many of the other map series. Uh, for instance, your, your flooding uh, and wetlands mapping, as well as your parks and recreation mapping. Okay. Okay. Well, Can I ask you. one more clarifying question about this? Absolutely. You're going to use these, you're going to split it for display purposes only, but you're not going to organize the report like section one, all the stuff about section one, right? Correct. Okay, that's Correct. great. This is just so we can zoom in a little bit more and you're able to see that detail because the study area is, is very large and encompasses a lot. And for something as detailed as your land use map, it's very difficult to see those very small distinctions uh, between, you know, very small um, commercial <laughs> parcels um, when you're zoomed all the way out. So this is, yeah, just for um, illustrative purposes. Yeah, First. and Allison, um, the other thing too is, is and you might be getting to this point, um, is that so many of the items that we are examining as part of this process, don't they're not gonna stop at an arbitrary boundary, <laughs> yeah. right? So we're looking at it, you know, comprehensively and collectively how, how everything works together within the entire waterfront revitalization area. And I would just like to chime in for one minute about the importance um, of uh, being accurate in the maps. I, I agree with Charles to, you know, try to present them in a way that makes sense to people, especially if you're talking about buy-in from community members, because I find when they're presented with a complicated map like this, they zero in on what they know about their neighborhood and their area. And if they find that it isn't depicted or labeled right, then they start to suspect the whole map. So mm -hmm. it sounds like you know, it's a minor issue, but I think making sure that it is accurate and labeled accurately is important for community buy-in. So yeah. ju jumping on what Susie's saying, will we have the opportunity to point out things that should be highlighted more? Yes, we would appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to Susie's point, some of the um, updates that we've made, we heard from the public when we had uh, that, that initial series of, of open houses, which is part of the process, which is great. Um, you know, and, and yes, we, are, we would look for you to, to help us to make sure that, that we're getting everything um, correctly. How, how, would you like, how would you like us to, to make those comments? Well, we are finalizing um, with now that we've gotten, you know, buy in in terms of the, the separation of, of focusing in on, on these three sections for presentation purposes. We're going to finalize updating all the existing mapping and then we will share that with you and uh, we'll probably do a OneDrive link right Sarah. I think that'll probably be yeah. easiest and then you can mark it up. Um, there'll be PDFs. You can mark up the PDF. You can print, hands write, and and get you know email us at it or comments. <laughs> Whatever format works best for you, um, you know we'll we will take it. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it'll be. Um, I'll have to get uh, you know talk with our GIS group to see when all the the edits will be finalized, and then you know probably two or three weeks after that, we'd ask to get comments back from from all of you. Yeah, we really appreciate your input on that, particularly on a land use map. Um, we typically map what has been assessed by the, the town or the county, what assessed land use that that parcel is classified as. And a lot of times that doesn't necessarily match the current use. So we really do value um, your input uh, to make this as accurate as possible. Great. Okay. So uh, thanks, everybody. We appreciate that.
Um, at this point, we're going to shift gears and uh, turn it over to Barbara Kendall, who is going to give us an overview of the Harbor Management Plan. Um, and that'll set the foundation for our discussion um, uh, for the rest of, of our meeting today. So Barbara, you should be able to hopefully share your screen. Barbara, it looks like you are yeah, muted. I know I'm muted. I'm still I'm I'm I had a bunch of stuff open on my screen and I know <laughs> when I'm working from home. Just want to make sure I didn't have too many things open for um yeah. trying to show the slideshow. Okay. So share screen. There you go. And there is the PowerPoint. There it is. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, looks great, Barbara. Okay. <clears throat> All righty. So, harbor management plans are uh, now a required part of a new LWRP or an LWRP that comes in for an amendment. And <coughs> Prior to 1992, there, there was a recognition that um, there was a need for more uh, tools for municipalities to manage their harbors. Basically, it was seen that there was more recreational boating, you know, competition for space in harbors, changes in use of harbors. And so, <clears throat> and also conflicts. I love this photo of this little guy in the boat next to the big, big uh, container ship in the tugboat. Uh, so the our enabling legislation for the waterfront revitalization program, which was enacted in 1981, was amended in 1992 to add clear authority for local governments to develop a harbor management plan and local laws that would then implement that harbor management plan and be able to regulate activities in the harbor. So Article 42 was amended, and then the New York State Regulations 19 uh, NYCRR parts 600, 601, and then especially 603 is where all the harbor management requirements are can be found. So what the harbor management plan is intended to do is address conflict, congestion, competition for space in your harbor area. And it doesn't just have to be the harbor. You know, now it's 2022 and we have a lot of LWRPs that don't really have a harbor, a defined harbor, but they have a lot of water uses. So it's really what we call the wet side of your LVRP, the wet side of your coastal area, not the land where a lot of the rest of the LVRP addresses the land uses. This is addressing the water uses, whether it be you know, a carved out harbor or just you know, a straight shoreline area or something in between. Um, it's, it applies to out to your municipal boundary or 1500 feet from the shore. Um, and then in Long Island is coordination with the trustees. But I, I did some reading today and I understand that Brookhaven, your trustees is, responsibilities are now combined with the town board. Is that correct in Brookhaven? I believe that's correct. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, that's okay. my understanding. So in other towns, you would need to coordinate with trustees, but in your case, um, that's combined. Um, and the reason it says to 1500 feet is a municipality that say their boundary was at the shoreline, yours is not, but say it was at the shoreline, they now have the authority, the villages now have the authority to go out 1500 feet um, and, and regulate those water uses, even though their municipal boundary does not. Um, so in your case, you have the jurisdiction to go out to your municipal boundary limit, which is the jurisdiction up to the three mile limit. Is that correct, I believe? Yes, it's about three miles um, from yeah. the, the Fire Island right. uh, land area. So you, you can do that, but the Harbor Management Plan can define more reasonable area than 1500 feet 
per jurisdiction, which I think is what I've heard the town would like to do, or you're discussing that still, I think. But so there, there is that flexibility since your comment goes out so far, it doesn't have to be 1500 feet. The law gives, gives it 1500 feet, but in your case, it could be farther if you wanted to. Um, and the harbor management plan can be a separate section or integrated into the LWRP. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. So the benefits um, of having a harbor management plan, which is now required, but these are the benefits, uh, it's required if you're doing an LWRP. Um, your, you determine you know, the, what the status is in your harbor and water area now and your strategy. State and federal government agencies have to adhere to your um, purposes and policies in the LWRP and your harbor management plan. You can get technical assistance from Department of State. You can include research design and, and other um, activities related to projects in the LWRP that relate to the harbor management area. Um, of course, we have our grant program. You can apply for financial assistance for projects in the harbor management area. Um, and one thing that's um, really addressed in the regulations that's brought forward is looking at regional, you know, cross boundary issues when it comes to your water side of your LWRP that um, you should and, and can address those in your, your um, harbor management plan. And then it, it, it allows you more of a partnership with the, with the coastal management program for looking at your harbor management area and what's important to you in partnership with us. Um, uh, and then <clears throat> probably the, the biggest benefit is that once the Secretary of State approves your LWRP, it's completed with the harbor management plan included in there, it gives uh, Brookhaven the authority to regulate all structures and uses on the water side, um, again, to the municipal boundary, um, or 1,500 feet in your case, it can be out to the municipal boundary. And the municipality can impose fees that's specifically allowed in the laws and regulations for doing that. If anybody questions it, it's allowed in the law. Um, <clears throat> and then the coastal consistency provision, federal and state actions have to be consistent uh, with your harbor management plan and now the VRP. Uh, any standards that you have in there for siting of uses have to, the other agencies have to be consistent. And then your local government also must be consistent, but that's where you, your local consistency law comes in. That's how that will be used for the water side. And then you'll also have a harbor management law or some type of law if, if you don't already have a law like that. Um, <clears throat> The idea of the harbor management plan is to delineate areas similar to zoning. It's not, you know, a, a zoning law. The harbor management law is, is not another zoning law, but it the idea is to delineate areas for specific uses. So if I don't know if you can see it in this, um, this is up on uh, Lake Ontario, but it has the sort of one white area in the middle of the blue is a mooring area for commercial. And then the one up on the left is a mooring area for um, individual moorings, moorings for residential use. So that, that's just a simple example of how they're delineating their harbor area for different uses. Um, there's might be more complicated than that. <clears throat> so uh, preparing the, the plan, uh, it needs to be comprehensive. As I said a second ago, just regional needs, competing needs, and it should include all surface water. So in water areas adjacent to your shorelines, and then also, you know, bays or harbors, you know, say at the outlets of the rivers as they come out into the to the Atlantic Ocean in, in Brookhaven. So it should address anything that's happening in those areas. It should be done on a rational basis that that what might is make sense for your community so this is a uh, another one up on lake ontario sodas bay where they have you know they've sort of a conceptual plan here of where the um, purple is anchoring areas green is fishing areas blue is mooring and an aqua color is swimming areas so this is showing you know what's going on and um how the uses relate to each other so you need to have a map uh, and sometimes several maps. You might, you, know, you might need several maps for Brookhaven to show all this. 
So the required elements, uh, similar to an LVRP, the HMP has required elements, but they can be integrated into section two. So, you know, the, your, your consultants can, don't have to have a whole nother inventory and analysis. It can be integrated into what they're already working on for section two, but then, you know, describing what's in the harbor area. Has to include natural and cultural resources, physical features, uses of the surface waters and underwater land. So this picture is, you know, do you have commercial uh, fishing operations as well as private pleasure boats uh, utilizing your waters? Uh, it should address issues and conflicts, you know, public health and safety, interference, water quality, infrastructure, um, commercial vessel support, dredging, uh, protecting water dependent uses, which is what the LWRP program is all about in the coastal area. Uh, <coughs> so it should address um, these items as they relate to your community. Uh, it also should list existing authorities, federal, state, city, you know, for your case, town, also the villages, town trustees, um, county, if it was applicable, and, and if you have a harbor master, what, what their authority is. And then opportunities. Um, is there land that you want to target for the future for water dependent uses, wetland, rest wetland restoration, and public access uh, and redevelopment? And then objectives. Um, do you want to protect specific water dependent uses, provide those commercial fishing facilities, protect water quality, a balance among all the uses, and what are your public access goals and scenic quality goals? Um, maps are required. Uh, this one is of Sackett's Harbor. I don't know if you can see it. There's a thin red line on the top. That's the 1500 feet because they're a village. But then they also have, you know, the little red dots are there's marinas, public docks. And then the black dotted line, that's their vessel regulation zone that is delineated. Um, there's, they have a much larger, looks more like an engineering map that delineates the actual parcels and where that marina, uh, the Navy Point Marina, and the public, <laughs> you know, shows in much more detail at a um, larger scale how that vessel regulation zone works. And that 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 more detailed vessel regulation zone map is then um, part of their harbor management. They call it their waterfront management law. References that detailed ve vessel regulation map. So that's how their regulation works. And then implementation techniques for the Harbor Management Plan, uh, similar to the LWRP and along with the LWRP, your local consistency law and the, the coastal policies implement the Harbor Management Plan. Um, sometimes up in Alexandria Bay, they have a docking facilities law, which is in addition to the Harbor Management Law because they have wanted really detailed description. Actually, I think they had it before they had the LBRP, and then they just kind of revised it for the LBRP of, of what, what they require for docs. Um, studies and research can be included in the Harbor Management Plan or as part of Section 4 of your LBRP, but as they relate to your harbor, um, studies that you want to do in the future or studies that were done in the past, the capital projects, and then um, other actions that, that the town might be considering for the harbor area. And then the last thing, and I just wanted to show what some resources that we've developed at the Department of State. So um, I believe the consultants had this, but just, just let me know if you don't, um, an uh, inventory and analysis toolkit. And in that inventory, this is about 10 pages long, but the last few pages in this toolkit are specifically for the harbor management plan. And I really encourage you and or anybody else on the WAC as well, um, if you want to look at this, this this checklist has um, on the top, it is is this element present and a priority. So for example, commercial shipping, you would check that off. Is it not present and a priority? You want more commercial shipping? Is it present and not a priority? Or is it not present and non-priority? So every this is all 
listed the way the regulations are and our attorney, it looks very detailed, but the reason I, I wanted to point this out is our attorney will check off all these things to make sure your harbor management plan includes all these things. These are all the numbers from the regulation, 603.3 has to adjust. I mean, if there's nothing there, if there's no mineral extraction, you just say it's not there, and then you don't have to address it in your harbor management plan. Um, there's So that's the first page of the, the harbor management plan. The, the second plate, the next page of this um, has, in addition to the inventory, you need to you know, identify the H&P boundary, discuss issues of local enforcement, as I just talked about. Some of these other things from the regulations that need to be addressed are in this checklist. And then the last page is a good list of um, existing authorities of federal and state agencies um, that you know can just kind of check down and see if you've addressed that in the harbor management plan. And then the last thing is <clears throat> there's an appendix, appendix three in our LWRP preparation guidance document, the one with a cover, cover, cover with colored pictures on the front. Um, this is guidelines for the preparation of harbor management plans. So pretty much everything I've been talking about is in this um, appendix three, and it goes into more detail as well about some of the requirements. All righty, that's it. Jackie, you're muted. Thank you. The guidance document that Barbara referenced has a has a, a spot right at the corner of my desk. <laughs> um, Barbara, thank you so much. Um, I think that that's really helpful because uh, it is a very important part of the LWRP integrated in looking at what you called the wet side um, of where we are. And um, I think uh, I've mentioned this before, uh, the town has put together a really great representation of uh, organizations and people on this committee. So we're really looking forward to the discussion about the water side of things today. Um, and some things that we wanna talk with you about are, and, and Mary and I see your hand raised, um, some things we wanna talk about are, you know, what are some issues that you see uh, related to, to, you know, harbors, water, uh, surface waters, et cetera. And, and what are some uses that you think are important that we need to, uh, to Barbara's point in that checklist that, that should be prioritized? Um, before we get into that though, Marianne, you did have your hand raised. So if there's something that you would like to share. Yeah, we... uh, can you hear me? Oh, oh, yep, there you are, yes. <laughs> Um, I'd like to understand, Barbara, a little bit about the, um, particularly with the, I guess, the priority or the, the um, when you adopt it, when a, a harbor management plan is adopted, <coughs> how, how does the federal, how does that over, like, um, displace the federal, does it, how does it work with the federal law, particularly the Army Corps? Right. So in particular, for example, we had a really difficult time getting the permit for the living shoreline. Right. And so had the village had a harbor management plan or had this harbor management plan been in place, um, would that have made any difference in the application process if we had included that project and, and what that would entail? And secondly, that's one question. The other question is, um, oh, yeah, answer that first. Then I'll ask my second one. <laughs> Yeah, so it doesn't, does not, the, the harbor management plan is part of the LWRP, does not supersede any federal or state laws. So your local law can be stricter than, um, than Army Corps. You can have, you know, shorter dock restrictions, not allowing as long as, that's just, this is just one example, not allowing as long as, as Army or as wide as Army Corps. That, that, that's what stricter would mean. Um, or you can just use what Army Corps, but um, <laughs> so it, it does not supersede any other. Okay. Um, I don't know whether it would have helped you with, I think, okay. I don't know whether it would have helped you with, with, with the permit or not, you know, it, to be showing your resiliency um, goals of the village would, I'm sure would, would help, but I, I guess I, I, I'm not sure. 
I, I, you know, through our experience, and I don't want to take too much time. Yeah, it wouldn't have helped. Uh, my second question uh, is just that, does this, does the LWRP have federal review or it's just through the state department of state? Uh, oh, I was there like a consistency review through the. Uh, I'm sorry. So, so the, the, um, I wasn't muted when I was talking before, was I? I guess not. You would have told me. Okay. So, um, um, the LWRP, in, in, including the Harbor Management Plan, gets reviewed by NOAA's Office of Coastal Management, the federal government, after the Secretary of State approves it. So, or well, well, actually, even during the 60-day review, they take a first look at it. But the more in-depth review is actually after the Secretary of State approval. So it gets looked at twice by them. And then they give what's called concurrence with we're asking for um, the coastal boundary of New York State to be amended to include the LWRP. NOAA concurs. Yes, we agree. We, we, you can amend no, no New York State coastal boundary with your LWRP and the policies and descriptions of those policies that you have in your LWRP. So Thanks. yes, NOAA gets reviewed. Thank you. Okay, uh, Susie, I know you had your hand up. Um, yeah, I don't want to hold up the group, but just a little bit more understanding. So when we get to specifics, so this is about use, which in my mind is a little different than activities. Um, so I'm wondering whether it's about, well, these are the areas that could be used for X, or is it these are the areas where these specific activities are allowed or not allowed? That's one question. And the other is, how does it pertain to, I understand it pertains to public areas, but what about private areas, private marinas, um, yacht clubs, things like that? And the third one is, and I, I may not have been listening, but this sounds like there's a lot of legislative activities here about what can be done and what can't be done, local laws, et cetera. And my understanding, this is a blueprint, right? a plan, and it's not really introducing legislation, but talking about what laws could be passed in Brookhaven in order to facilitate the goals, the facilitate the goals of the plan. So I guess that was a lot of question. Yeah, I think I can probably answer part of it, and then maybe Alan can help as well. Um, so marinas and I forget what your other land use. Yeah, yacht clubs. Yacht clubs. I mean, whatever is built on the land will be regulated by your zoning law that you have, or if you end up, if you ever did amendments to your zoning law. So whatever a, a marina that was built on the land will be regulated by the zoning law. Um, if people want to build docks, either private residences or commercial, um, or want to put in moorings, which are attached to the bottom of the water body or um i don't know what else um floats or um well a lot of a lot of marinas have areas large areas that are water surrounded by protective docks so they're sort of on the land and the water that was my right. so the reference. part on the water would be regulated by the harbor management law or waterfront management law whatever you want to call it yeah. um, the in water structures um, but then another part of it is, and I, I think, again, now I can help us, but you may already have this, the navigation part of it, how fast the boats can go, where they can go, where, where um, you know, where people can swim, that those kinds of things um, would be, the, those kinds of uses would be regulated as well if, you, if they don't already. So Alan, do you want to help us out here? Yeah, so the Town of Brookhaven has code, it's broken into various chapters in order to make it more organised. But yeah, there are there is code that specifies, for example, Chapter 8 talks about um, waters. That breaks down where marinas can be, where a mooring field can be. There is laws in place that state explicitly what can and cannot be done on land, under, underwater land. Okay, that's helpful. Um, I'm a specific example might be, for example, the ferries that go back and forth. 
uh, across Brookhaven uh, area and also the National Seashore. And I know Alex has had lots of questions about water taxis and who regulates mm -hmm. them and where they can go and and things like that. So that was what I was thinking about, about private activities because these are private entities that ferries in the water taxis. Sure. And Susie, that's a great segue. I know Alex, you had your hand up. Um, do you have any comments or questions? Thank you, Susie. Yeah. I do, um, and thank you. Um, so I, I, I'm just curious, because Fire Island is, is made up so uniquely mm -hmm. with multiple layers of jurisdiction. And so most of the harbors that are part of this study or part of this process are within the boundaries of the National Seashore. And so we manage 4,000 feet out into the Great South Bay, uh, mostly the water column, and then there are certain areas that are owned the bay bottom by other groups. Um, so it, it will be interesting, not necessarily to see how this evolves in the approval process, but what is kind of the agreement that we all get to before it gets to the approval process of the state or NOAA. Um, because you have these layers of jurisdiction that if the town excuse me, if the communities are developing these kind of zones or these activities within their harbors, what does the approval process look like before it gets to, not approval, probably consent, whatever you want to say, that there's agreement because now you're, you're crossing over boundaries that is federally managed or under federal, federal jurisdiction. Um, so whether it's a dock, whether it's, you know, mooring, whatever you decide, there's got to, there should be some layered approach, approval process that we, we go through before it goes to the state and to eventually mm -hmm. go off. De definitely. And that all has to be spelled out in the LWRP because yeah. you cannot supersede, you know, the federal, what the Fire Island has jurisdiction for. So uh, there should be a, a map showing that 4,000 feet for Fire Island and then narrative listing what the Fire Island Master Seashore regulations are for various activities and then showing where the town of Brookhaven has jurisdiction or say the village of Patchogue um, and how you have an agreement between everyone to do that. Yeah, and, and there is a map that, that does demonstrate and show that. And it's quite interesting just, you know, I don't know how many marinas, maybe Susie knows this, how many marinas we have in, in, across all of Fire Island, but they're plentiful. Um, so if we start going through this process, it'd just be interesting to see how we all communicate and collaborate together to come to uh, an agreement before this whole package is forward. So yeah. No, so thank so you. Alex, um, if I could just, uh, from a procedural standpoint, internally where we are right here, and then more, I do see your hand raised, we'll get to you. Um, part of what we were thinking in terms of how we move forward with this because this is a this is a big chunk and a big discussion um to be had and, and this is not going to be the one and only time we have a discussion about this but you know today we're hoping to introduce what this is get some initial thoughts from this group in terms of some of the the, the issues challenges that we need to be aware of some of what you think are important priorities whether you know it's those ferries or it's marinas or um, you know, what have you, um, so that we can then take that back and in, in concurrent to that, our team is examining the existing regulations and code that the town has um, and looking at what is already regulated and saying, does that address some of the challenges that we've heard? Um, but what I see uh, is an opportunity is once we start, this starts to take shape, sharing that with this group, you all represent, um, you know, really important stakeholders as part of this and, and really listening to what your thoughts are as we start to piece everything together, we start to develop some of those maps of priority uses, identifying are there, um, you know, are there conflicts that we need to, to be able to identify a more appropriate way to address moving forward and, and what is that way um, and mapping that out through this effort. Um, I think it's gonna be an iterative process collectively with all of us here to get to that harbor management plan in a way that um, recognizes all the appropriate entities that do have jurisdiction and, and then also trying to advance what 
the town and the community's goals are uh, for for the water. Um, and so I think it, it's it's to be continued. I think there's going to be a lot of back and forth um, with this. And if there are other uh, stakeholders that we need to bring into the conversation as a part of this, it, we can do that through this effort. Uh, yes, Maura, go ahead. So I want to, and Alan's on here, which is good. So um, would this help to address, I know right now we are trying at the Mastabee Conservancy to do some eelgrass restoration and some oyster and kelp farming as educational as well as cleansing, not necessarily for commercial or being able to eat the kelp or oysters. Um, and we had been working with Craig at the town and then we were supposed to be getting some sites and somehow there's a problem with the Bayman in Bellport that's affecting what's happening with us and I'm, I'm Alan's laughing <laughs> because I'm wondering if having a harbor management map like this would help to maybe mitigate some of these disputes um, in a situation like this and maybe Alan you could Jump in yeah, on certainly. Too. So, yeah, one of the points of the harbor management plan, in fact, the LWRP in general, is to reduce conflict between commercial and recreational users, and in this case, uh, commercial and um, conservation users. So, what Mara was specific well, talking about was a management zone. So, the town has management areas within um, Grey South Bay and Riches Bay which is set aside for planting oysters, clams, perhaps seaweeds down the line. Um, but they can't be used for anything else. They can't be used for harvesting. They can't be used for collecting and selling or giving away or, or recreational users in, as in harvesting themselves. Um, so what happened was we tried to enlarge a management area in Bellport Bay, uh, the Bayman did not approve of that because they were concerned that it would encroach into the areas during winter time when it's gusty, it's windy, and it's an area where they could safely harvest during winter. So it's a long convoluted story, but to get back to Mara's point, yes, the harbor management plan will hopefully reduce conflict between the various users of the town's underwater lands. Yeah, and just yeah, a kind of a follow up or just a, another question. Uh, so, I mean, my understanding, the harbor management plan basically is uh, a, a way to look at all the different players and map all the different players in the harbor area and who has jurisdiction over which area, or would they also have an overriding power that those municipalities and those government agencies don't have, or is it mostly just showing who's in charge of what and, and, and letting people know what these areas are able to do? Does that well, make sense? The, the plan is what you said first. It will show who what the uses are and who has jurisdiction, but then um, the Harvard Management plan, Management plan needs to be implemented by a local law, one or two or more local laws. So, uh, you know, between Alan and, and Jackie and Sarah, you know, they'll just identify if you have, the town may already have local laws that do that well enough, or you might want to make amendments to the laws that <clears throat> Alan mentioned or any other local laws relating to what's happening um with docking and, and waterside uses or you might need a new law so but it, it does need to be implemented the LWRP needs to be implemented by a local consistency review law that also relates to the harbor management plan but the harbor management plan um our attorneys have determined needs to be implemented by a harbor management or water management law so there does need to be some type of local law either existing or new to, to implement it which doesn't supersede federal or state or county laws. It would be um, local level. I'm sorry, just as a follow, would you also go to your federal if, if you wanted to implement laws that they were the top dogs on for them to, to implement these laws? 
no. Um, I'm not. So there are the, any attorneys on this? Any attorneys? Yeah. On this <laughs> yeah. So my understanding, more and, and Barbara, if I'm off base, um, feel free. But um, so the the local laws that may already be on the books um, to address some of these are um, implemented and enforced by by the town, right? Um, if there are new uh, local laws that result uh, as a part of this process in this harbor management plan, those would also be the responsibility of the town to implement. If there are existing uh, you know, regulations and, and laws at the federal level, level, those would continue to be in place. Uh, a local law passed through uh, that might implement the harbor management plan is not going to replace that. Um, if, if, if that's the question that, that you're asking. Yeah, for example, the Army Corps of Engineers regulations, which um, um, somebody mentioned earlier, those are implemented by the Federal Army Corps of Engineers. They have their own process. Nothing that the Harbor Management Plan would do would change those laws. However, the Army Corps, once it's adopted and approved by NOAA, the Army Corps staff would need to look at your LWRP to see what mm -hmm. it says. It's not going to change their laws, their federal laws, but they do have to consider what's in the LWRP and the Harbor Management Plan. Does that make sense? I just wanted to say there's somebody who didn't exactly get the big picture that you've explained it very well. It sounds like it's a, it's a snapshot, a comprehensive look at the area and then analyzing what's good what needs to be fixed, where the conflicts are, and then checking what's available in terms of existing code um, and supplementing that with new code, new legislation, and collaboration with other jurisdictions to make sure that everything is consistent and working together. Did I get that right? That's a great elevator speech. That's great. That <laughs> you know down. what, Susie? I'm glad we're recording that. We might just play that back when we're talking about harbor well, management plans elsewhere. As, <laughs> that was great. <laughs> as Alex has pointed out, anyone who spends time working with Fire Island stakeholders knows that it's all about seeing the big picture and how all the pieces fit together. That's what we do every day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Marty, I know you had your hand up, and my apologies. I, I, I missed that earlier. Yeah. My own I'm just stating the obvious. I mean, obviously, there is no existing harbor management plan. Uh, I assume there are reference documents from a practical standpoint to get started on such a thing, because if it's going to be uh, starting from scratch, kind of an all hands on deck, let's get going. I think the first thing you're going to conflict with is the conflict of where to start. So mm -hmm. is there an existing reference document that says this is how uh, this is how this was done elsewhere, and then kind of plug in all the local considerations. Does such a thing exist? Yeah, Marty, there's some pretty great guidance and, and examples of other communities that have implemented harbor management plans. And okay. Alan, I think there's uh, you have a, a hard copy of something from, is it the 80s or something like that, uh, that does exist for the town? Oh, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Good, however, great. however, um, it's it's really dated, and you know, I think um, a lot of the potential conflicts that um, may have existed then might be different today. Um, you know, I'm not sure. You know, more to your point, that kelp farming may have been considered then <laughs> in terms of a potential use. The um, operation so, in LWR is local, so yeah. I, I think that that something like that massive Bible we just showed, uh, you plug in local considerations and you're halfway home. Yeah, yeah. I think it's um, we've we've been talking internally. We're we're pretty excited to be moving into this this piece of of your LWRP and Harbor Management uh, Plan effort because there are a lot of considerations, and I know we've kind of been dancing around that. Um, you know, to your point, Alex, from earlier, um, throughout our conversations early, you know, in the past three committee meetings we've had, but now we're, now we're facing it full on, uh, diving into that. And Marty, to your point, pulling what we can that does already exist. Um, and, and uh, quite honestly, 
figuring out where the gaps are that we do need to explore a little bit more. Yeah. Other comments or questions with regard to the Harbor Management Plan it itself, uh, you know, what it is, how it gets applied, et cetera. So with that, let's dive in. I think we've already started uh, to talk a little bit about some of the potential conflicts or issues um with regard to various uses within um you know your your water area um what are some of the the key issues that you see uh that you would like to to have addressed or explored as part of this yeah, actually I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here so this morning i wrote down some potential ideas um so one was to obviously to reduce the conflict between commercial recreational users, reduce conflict between commercial and conservation areas, such as the management zones we use. Big thing in the Great South Bay and Mauritius Bay, improve water quality um, to reduce the, you know, the likelihood of harmful algal blooms. The town currently plants millions of oysters and clams um, each year. Um, but maybe there's a way that we can do that better. Um, we need to hopefully increase seafood, uh, not seafood, sea grass populations. They are shrinking in size rapidly. So maybe there's something we can do to mitigate that and reduce it to improve those populations. Um, there may be areas or, that we need to, or marinas or docks that we need to, to improve. Um, Maybe necessary to put in breakwaters in some areas to allow you know the safer passage of boats into these marinas. Could be potential for beach nourishment, uh, mostly on the bay side. Um, the Atlantic coast of Fire Island is mostly done by the federal government, so this is beach nourishment on in the bay side. Dredging, ongoing maintenance dredging. There may be a ne need for it in um, new areas, so capital dredging. There may be a need for artificial reefs in some places. Um, it may be necessary for bay bottom restoration. Um, not exactly, no, I don't exactly know how that could occur, but it's, it's possible. Um, and as was discussed before, um, we have code that discusses boat moorings. Um, most of those mooring areas are on the North shore. I don't think there's any on the, on the South shore. It's mostly handled by marinas. Um, but maybe there are areas that need to be looked into as a potential for putting like a temporary mooring field during um, summertime. Alan, you haven't given any thought at all to this, have you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought I'd better jump in before other people are. Uh, that is great. Oh, ideas. that's a great start. Thank you very much. That's a pretty comprehensive list. Allison, I know you have your hand up. Do you have some other items to add? Yeah, one I just want to make sure is on your radar. The Nature Conservancy actually owns a chunk of the bay and not just the bottom, but the water column, like the deed even talks about the air and the birds mm. and stuff. We'll ignore that for now. Um, so it would just be great to make sure that all is clarified in this plan because it's often a source of confusion and headaches for the town because people want to do stuff and they're not sure if it's their job to regulate it. So if we could make sure that that's all okay. spelled out here, I think that would save everybody a lot of headaches. Okay. Great. Uh, Allison, there's no, uh, you guys are planning on hanging on to that land too. There's no plan to. Yeah, we're as... planning to hang on to that land. It was donated for the purposes of environmental protection. And so it would be pretty hard for us to not hang on to it. Gotcha. Allison, are there, um, what sort of restrictions is, is there? Um... Yeah, no harvesting of shellfish. Um, there's actually an old document that I will make sure you get um, mm -hmm. about the Nature Conservancy's policy on bulkheads and uh, some agreement they had at the time with the town to enforce that. I think nearly everyone at the town has turned over since that time, except maybe Ed. Um, <laughs> so it's it's a lot of like what happens <coughs> on the shoreline and the harvesting of things, in particular shellfish on the bottom. Okay, yeah, if, if you have um, that information you could share with us, that would be really helpful. I will, yeah. Thank you. Um, how much Morris. of, uh, oh, how, much sorry, of go ahead, yeah. how much of Brookhaven Harbor or uh, of the Brookhaven 
portion of the bay is owned by the TNC? I don't know. It's not that much, but it's a good it's a good big piece. What, do you is know, it, Alan? Like percentage wise? I, I, I think it's oh sorry, Alan's trying to talk. Sorry, I, I don't know the exact size, but it's to the left, the western side of, of the the bay. Yeah, it's really where like the um where the water only section, kind of where the town of Islip starts. I believe it's from Blue Point to the point of Blue Point across to like Talisman. And then I think it's Hecksher Point to the east end of Point of Woods, maybe. So it's pretty large. It's probably most of that. It's 13,000 acres. Oh, actually, do you know what? It says it's about 20% of the underwater lands in the Great South Bay. So I don't know what percentage it is of Brookhaven, but it's a lot. It's big. It's a lot. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, so just, if you go out there, you can't really tell. Like, there's some very inconspicuous markers to help the bayman, but we, you know, there's no like sign, so nobody really. Most people don't even know. So, so with the harbor management map and the, that would uh, show who owns the bottom in the different places. I, I know. Yeah, that it really needs to. And I did. Our GIS folks did get those files over to the folks mm -hmm. at MJ so they could include them in the maps. Okay, yeah, because I know by us there's in in uh, Mastic Beach there's issues where P the property owners and the town who owns the bay bottom and that stuff. So I'm just curious if that would be part of the um, the mapping. We will certainly do our best to try to get that as accurate as possible, Maura. Um, but yeah, we would we would be looking to. Um, you know, I, right now, just looking who's on the screen with us, Alan, Allison, Alex, uh, you know, certainly be looking to you guys to help us under, you know, make sure that the data that we are getting and mapping is accurate in terms of uh, some of those jurisdictions. Great. Other, other, you know, thoughts and ideas in terms of, you know, issues, concerns, or things you, you think need to be considered as we're moving forward with the harbor management plan. Jackie, I have uh, one question, if that's OK. Yeah, please go ahead, Anthony. Um, so in, in preparing the, uh, the LWRP, how much thought or consideration should be put into um, what what potentially happens with, uh, with the FEMP plan uh, moving forward? I mean, if the Army Corps comes in and, and makes drastic changes to the landscape of areas like Mastic Beach or all along the uh, uh, the south shore of the town of Brookhaven. Are those things that we should try to incorporate into the uh, the plan proactively or uh, kind of just uh, respond to them as they're as they're brought forth? Um, Anthony, that's a really great question. And, and honestly, that's something that Andrew and our team have been talking about um, offline. Um, to the extent that we can understand what is planned and anticipated there, we'd like to identify that as part of this process um, and integrate that into the overall, uh, you know, LWRP. Obviously, things are going to be changing um, and we might not be able to do that as accurately um, as we, you know, would hope. But to that end, um, we have, our team has identified a number of stakeholders that we want to either re-engage with because we might have already spoken to them early on in the process or that we haven't had a chance to have direct communication with just from a scheduling standpoint. And Army Corps is certainly um, you know, one of those stakeholders because um, not only what the plans are, particularly in the Mastic Beach area um, right now uh, in terms of, of affecting that area, but that might affect other proposed land uses um, and land use projects that, that we're trying to focus in on as well as the water side of things. So. Um, Short answer is to the extent we can include that into the conversation and into your LWRP, we'd, we'd very much like to um, uh, like to do that. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, part of the reason I mentioned it too is because I, I think, um, and Alan could probably speak better this than, than I can, but um, in some preliminary conversations with the, the Army Corps, it seemed like um, they were willing to adopt or, or incorporate some uh, legwork the town had done with regards to the Mastic Beach restoration program. Um, and rather than kind of reinvent the wheel or or them providing us uh, with direction as to like how, how they would prefer to proceed, um, taking 
what we had already done, uh, what the town had already done, and kind of incorporating it as part of the FIMP. So maybe if the timing works out, uh, if if we if we complete the LAWRP, maybe the the federal government can more incorporate what we're doing as opposed to us being responsive to what what they're putting out. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Other ideas, thoughts that you'd like to see uh, addressed um, from the water side of things? Okay. Are there priorities that uh, in terms of, of uses, uh, Alan, you, you referenced the, uh, the potential conflicts, the commercial side of things, the recreation, the conservation, um, certainly a lot of, of what could be uh, varying <laughs> uh, priorities, right? Uh, but what could also be maybe um, have some similar goals uh, in terms of improving water quality, et cetera. Um, any priorities that, that you would like to see addressed or conflicts such as that that you experience or hear about that you would like to have? Uh, make sure that that uh, are addressed through this. Yeah, qu quite a few things that I've mentioned or listed um, are linked. You know, if you improve water quality, you may improve shellfish mm -hmm. habitat. If you plant more oysters and clams, you may also improve water quality. If you improve water quality, you'll likely bring back the seagrasses. If you bring back the seagrasses and the clams, commercial and recreational fishermen will be happier. So a lot of these, these factors are linked. Um, vocally, conflicts are often the biggest thing is that people are upset that they can't fish where they have in the past. Um, and then they talk to the town, they talk to the town board. Um, so conflicts are probably the, the most vocal issue that I'm aware of, um, okay. but environmentally the water quality would be, be the major thing because it's it's a link to so many other facets that we're hoping to improve. Okay. And now, um, Alan, just a, a more detailed question for you, um, you know, in terms of the conflict with regard to fishing. Um, is, is the reason that folks can't fish in the locations where they wanted to because additional regulations have put in, been put into place or it's the changing, I'm going to say waterscape <laughs> and, and habitat um of where they used to be fishing what, what's driving that change well the one that Mara brought up in Belport Bay was the residents there wanted they had a management zone they wanted I think it was like one acre in size they wanted to increase it to about two acres um so the residents in Belport were supportive of increasing the management zone but the commercial fishermen they harvest around that area were against it um mm. So okay. the town is the one that imposes the management zone. So we were going ahead with it, but then the commercial fishermen said, hang on a sec. They spoke mm -hmm. to the town board. And so it's in limbo at this moment. And then that creates issues down the line and that's um, impacting Mara's project um, of um, Mastic Beach. So one conflict can have ripple effects throughout the okay. entire South Shore. Everything else that they've done is- okay. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate that. Other initial thoughts or ideas with regard to issues or even opportunities? Um, I've got another one that sometimes comes up um, in the vicinity of the shoreline. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when people are trying to do things to stabilize their shoreline to prevent erosion, which sometimes is allowed, sometimes not, often it's allowed. Um, you know, there's a lot of new push, I would say, to, to use less hard structures, more quote unquote living shorelines. That is not habitat restoration. That is still shoreline stabilization, but it's a more friendly version. But doing that takes up more space. And often people think it's no big deal. Just go out into the water a bit. That's not always allowed, depending on where, whose jurisdiction is where, as we've already talked about, it's very complicated in the Brookhaven water. Um, so that's just a, a particular area to maybe keep track of. Okay. Well, and that's a good um, note for our team um, to, to, to be cognizant of, you know, if there are areas along the shoreline that we might be 
um, through discussions with you proposing, you know, a more natural shoreline treatment versus a hardened shoreline treatment, recognizing that might not be feasible, um, right? Or, or if, if that is something that is recommended as a proposed project through the LWRP, the project itself might be an evaluation of what might be feasible with regard to a living shoreline um, and, and the location for that. And something else on that same subject, it would be great to like back zoom out a little and take a look all the way across the town hmm. and recognize that if we harden every inch of the shoreline, we're really going to have a lot of problems that we don't want. So, you know, right now, especially at the state level, that's regulated on one property at a time basis. But I think a project like an LWRP is a great opportunity to kind of think these are areas that where where we kind of have to allow some stabilization because houses are in such danger, whereas these are places where we can disallow it so that we can keep those coastal processes that are really important happening. Because if we make the whole thing a concrete bathtub, we're going to be in a world of hurt. Well, and um, you know, Maya, I'll just talk for a minute because Patrick just went through this. We'll have at the end, I think I said this before, I mean, Jeremy will say this, I will have the largest uh, permitted living shoreline in New York State. Right, it's 1,200 feet long. It's it's a really and it, we really had a hard time getting that through. Not only the DC but the Army Corps, um, not getting it through, but just having them process it and look at it and everything. And um, and I just through that process, also we've gotten substantial grant funds from the Department of State. So this is a benefit to have that in, you know, in the LWRP. And I, I agree with Alice, and I think that's a you know as we look at the whole area where. You know, we, what are the, you know, I mean, I guess it's, I mean, I forget, we've done our LWRP so long ago, I don't remember, but to have those policies in place, what is a, you know, a, a not a hardened, but what are the alternatives? And then where would be appropriate? Because then obviously for granting purposes, you know, if a community has an area that, you know, or, or we see that that's an option, one, it's good for the environment. Uh, we are trying to do some habitat restoration in ours, um, but like, what does that look like? And by identifying specific location, it enables uh, applications for grant funds, you know, easier to make. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Susan. Um, I just wanted to, uh, mentioned that Fire Island is currently doing a study on wastewater management for the future. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to make sure that it's on your radar that, um, and this is just brainstorming, but there are some options that involve wastewater management that involves the waterfront or even pumping wastewater underneath the bay for, you know, I know that sounds remote, but we're looking at absolutely everything. Uh, over to mainland um, treatment centers. So I think we ought to, for barging, for example, so I think we ought to make sure that we include options for wastewater management. We're looking at use. And the other thing is I agree with both Allison and um, Marion that I think we have to look at this comprehensively, but I also don't think it's one size fits all and that mitigation and adaptation is so unique to the geography of the area, that it should be a, a careful analysis. There should be guidelines for analysis and appropriate interventions, depending on the location. Great. Thank you, Susan. So, um, um, yeah, go ahead, Mark. So can I, I just need a little um, understanding on this. So I know in Master Beach, since I've been here 20 years, we've lost in that time, a considerable amount of our land, <laughs> you know, and I guess I'm trying to understand. So wouldn't it just be restoration? And maybe Marion could help a little with hers, you know, if we wanted to, and you know, part of what we would like to do is do some wetland restoration, but it's really a matter of putting back what was there before. Does that matter or that doesn't matter? Does that make sense, my question? I, I think just to respond to that, I think Susie kind of articulated part of my thought is that it depends on the situation. I mean, in the village of Patchogue, that's our public park. And that was one of the difficulties we had is that had we, 
you know, done the bulkhead landward, right, we would have had an easier issue doing the permitting, but we would have lost 70 feet of our park. So where, where do we have that conflict between the public use and, and, and addressing, you know, climate change and, and building resiliency? I mean, and, and so I think more, I, I, wait, is she there? She just moved. <laughs> um, you know, I, to that question, but where in Mastic Beach, you were able to, to, you're able to retreat and restore. We're not able to retreat at this point. And I think, you know, I don't know where that goes in the LWRP talking about retreating or what we're going to do in the face of sea level rise. But for us, that was our option. And obviously, like Susie said, your situation is different. And I think it's really a, a location by location determination. And Maura, it is a legal question of whether it matters that that used to be land. And, and I actually think like the statutes are different for state waters and town waters and private land and federal. So like it's actually, there's not even a one size fits all answer to that question. So, Hi, this, is, this is Jeremy, oh, too. Ahead, sorry. Mm -hmm. this, I think this to Allison's point and what Marion was talking about, um, I think it just ends up being um, just jurisdictional based on whether it's Army Corps, DEC, or whomever's um, coming in and how they're identifying their jurisdiction to those areas. I think that's typically it, right? Or am I wrong? Or? There's even more to it than that. Like, oh, that, if there's an act simple. of God that changes the boundary, it, it goes one way. If it's like a slow and gradual thing, if there's a different law. So it's it's super complicated. Okay. I was a little too thought that would be more uh, the simple version, but okay. So um, thanks everybody. I think um, you, you've got a little taste of, of what we will be continuing to talk about with the Harbor Management Plan. And um, I think that this might be um, certainly some challenging conversations uh, as we move forward to determine what makes the most sense, what's appropriate, what, um, you know, what can be uh, supported by the variety of stakeholders involved here. Um, and I'm just taking a look at our time. So I am going to wrap things up a little bit, but what what I'd like to ask if if you all would be willing is to continue to give some thought to whether it's some of those conflicts, some some um, items that you would like to see addressed, uh, some challenges that you have experienced or that you anticipate, um, given some of the trends in terms of uses or challenges, Susie, like what Fire Island is is trying to address with the wastewater aspect, um, and just send us an email with some ideas, just, you know, bullet points, ideas, whatever um, might be on your mind for this. We're going to be compiling all of this as we're gathering some of um, the known conditions, right, with regard to the water side of things and start start diving into that. Um, and if you could do that over the next two or three weeks, that would be really helpful for us. Um, and in terms of next steps, our next uh, WAC meeting will be on <laughs> November 9th. And what we are hoping to be able to share with you at that meeting are some more refinements to those proposed land uses that we had talked about and land projects uh, that we had talked about. And, and um, a couple of ideas came out of this discussion that I think we could also fold into the land side of things as well. Um, and so what we'll share some of those refined potential projects with you. Our team is currently working on that right now. As I mentioned before, our team is tending, intending to be down uh, and touring uh, the study area again in, in October. Um, we were just down there in July, I think. So we're gonna have a fall visit um, and really kind of truth test some of these proposed projects that we're thinking about and understanding um, kind of what, uh, what the on the ground situation is. Um, as I mentioned, we are initiating the Harbor Management Plan and we will be continuing to update that mapping that you saw. We will share that with you when that is done. And again, we'll ask for your feedback and input on that. Um, so that's where we are. We're continuing to, to move forward with these items. Really appreciate all of your time and thoughts. And um, if I could just, um, you know, uh, give you fair warning that over the course of the next two months, we might be reaching out to you individually uh, with questions uh, as we're getting into the harbor management plan a little bit more. Um, so just um, please, please keep an eye out if we do reach out to you uh, to have us schedule a little more uh, in-depth 
conversation about whatever your particular area might be um, to make sure that, that we're getting this accurate. All right. Um, uh, Barbara, Allen, anything else that you would like to add? No, I just want to say thank you. Um, such a beautiful day, at least here on Long Island. So I appreciate your time being inside and, and uh, contributing towards this meeting. Um, I just want to thank the, the team um, doing the study and Alan and the Brookhaven group for involving everybody and listening really authentically uh, to what people have to say. It's not easy to coordinate stakeholders, everybody who has a different point of view. So it's a really worthwhile process, I believe. And I, for one, don't kill me here, but I wouldn't mind meeting as a group uh, a little more frequently because I think we stimulate each other. We know each other and we work together, many of us. So that's another option. Sorry, folks. On that same note, actually, I was thinking earlier when you were talking about the conflict with the Bayman, Alan, has anybody from that fishing community been invited to join this group? I know it, it could be tricky and maybe as part of the public engagement, it's is the right way to get them because they're not a one size fits all bunch. I don't know, but I just feel like we don't want to come out with a big plan that's so important to those folks and have them be like, we had no idea this was happening. Yeah, so at the early stages of the LWP, when we were working out the Waterfront Advisory Committee, we spoke, we invited um, a ferry boat owner, um, she declined. Uh, we invited um, an agriculturalist. Um, he is on the committee, but I don't think he's ever been to one of these meetings. Mm -hmm. And But I don't believe that we invited any Bayman um, to this meeting. Okay. I think that you might want to invite Sue Wicks. She would probably be interested and she'd probably show up. Maybe we did. Huh? That name is familiar. I'm not too sure why, but it, my well, memory is bad and it was several years ago, so I'm not she, too sure who in, the meeting was. She's an oyster farmer and a former WNBA star. So no, we, we, we didn't. We do have an oyster farmer on this committee. Yeah. That person hasn't turned up to any of the meetings. The other aspect too is that we have a, a pretty um, lengthy stakeholder list. Uh, when we went through and had those stakeholder discussions, not everybody was able to attend or or followed up. But we can take another look because I do think there was some representation from the Bayman side of things on that list, but I, I, I can't recall it offhand. So let us go back and take a look at that. And once we have a little better sense of what this harbor management plan might be and you know what this mapping might be in, in terms of uses, that might be a really good opportunity to, to have a, another targeted kind of stakeholder group discussion. Um, and you know we're we're certainly happy to to entertain that if it means getting that meaningful input to shape this in a way that is something that the community at large uh, you know can 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 accept right or or support. That'd be great. Okay. Excellent. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, this will, this recording uh, will be posted on the project webpage on the Brookhaven Town website. Um, we will share with you um, the PowerPoint presentation. And Barbara, if we could ask you to share yours with us, we'll package it and get it to the committee if that's okay. Um, I think there's some helpful information there. So that if, as you're thinking of other ideas and you want to use that as a reference, you'll have that. Um, and with that, um, we, we will sign off and look forward to seeing you. Um, seeing you in November. And I want to thank Allison for that, uh, the guide that you had shared with us in the chat as well. So thank you for that. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you all. Yeah.